when we take notes on things that went well or didn't go well, we all become better gardeners year after year after year. And of course, I saved one of the most important things we can all be doing for our plants and the environment for last, and that is to go organic. The problem mm -hmm. is synthetic pesticides kill both the bad bugs and the good ones. They are non-selective, and that means they can't tell the difference between a damaging insect and a beneficial one. Welcome back, my friends, to the Epic Gardening Podcast. This week is all about solving problems in the garden. Believe it or not, if you can solve the problems, the plants sort of just grow themselves, or at least that's been my experience. And we'll see if it's the experience of our guest today. We have Susan Mulvihill back on the show. This is your second time on, Susan. And you're the author of a new book. You also have the Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, but your new book, the Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook, is out pretty soon here so thanks for coming on well thank you very much for having me kevin it's nice to be back yeah it's been a while i think you were on sometime in 2021 maybe yes yeah well congrats on the second book i, I love the yeah. theme we were just talking uh around your books it's helping people solve problems which to me th that is what stops someone from gardening in the first place yeah absolutely and i want folks to know that gardening is such a joy but if something comes along, I'm going to give some tips on how to deal with those problems. And, you know, once you start learning about different types of problems that might come up, you're going to be a much more successful gardener. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it's the knowledge and understanding that then leads to the application. I know today we're talking about avoiding a problem in the first place. Best practice is to keep your veggie plants healthy. I'm curious what makes your top list, because I think you see a lot of different recommendations go around. Right. So, you know, I thought it would be a great way to start with this because, you know, we gardeners encounter a lot of challenges that can impact the growth of our plants. So it might be a disorder that isn't caused by insects, it's not caused by disease pathogens, or maybe you do have a disease in your garden that's caused by bacteria, fungi, or viruses. So that can be really frustrating and discouraging. But what I want folks to know is there are so many things we can control. That way we can help our plants grow and either completely sidestep many of the problems or at the very least keep the plants healthier and better able to resist those challenges. So I think number one is to choose a sunny location for your garden and that really applies to brand new gardeners if they're looking for a spot to grow some vegetables. Uh, it's important to know that vegetable plants require a minimum of six to eight hours of sunshine each day in order to grow and produce well. Now, if you already have a garden spot, I wanted to point out something important which I discovered this year myself. Take a look around the area and see if any trees or hedges are casting new shadows on parts of your garden and give them a trim. So keep an eye on that sort of thing. Plant your crops at the right time. So cool season crops like lettuce and spinach need to be planted in the spring and warm season crops like tomatoes and peppers should be planted after the danger of frost has passed. If we plant crops too early or too late, the plants are more susceptible to problems and they might even die. Another thing that's important is to space your plants appropriately. When we crowd them together, it makes it harder for them to grow and produce because they're competing with each other for moisture, nutrients, and space. Even worse, disease pathogens can spread more easily when the plants are crowded. It can even make it easier for insects to move from plant to plant to plant. So check your seed packets or your plant tags or your vegetable gardening books to learn what the ideal spacing is. You also want to support your plants. This is going to help them grow well and it keeps the plant foliage off the ground where there might be some disease pathogens that can easily spread onto the foliage. The main crops I'm thinking of would be things like tomatoes, peppers, peas, and cucumbers. But it's a great idea to also grow squash family crops like winter squash and small pumpkins up on supports, partly to save space in the garden, but also to get the majority of their foliage off the soil which in turn reduces the chances of disease. 
And I have to add, it looks really cool. <laughs> I grow my pumpkins and winter squash and cucumbers on an arbor that I created with a livestock oh, panel. Wow. And yeah, it just looks really cool. It's a nice focal point for the garden and, um, and it's a fun way to grow them. You also wanna make sure you're giving your plants the right amount of water. And I have to say, it's like the Goldilocks thing. You don't wanna do sure. too much, you don't wanna do too little. If you overwater your plants, that's a very quick way to kill them because their roots just can't handle being wet all the time. In addition, when the plants are stressed, that makes them more susceptible to disease problems and also makes it more difficult for them to produce a normal crop. Early morning is really the best time of day to water. You also want to take good care of your soil. Now, you've probably heard that there are billions of microorganisms in just a teaspoonful of soil. It's important that we disturb those microorganisms as little as possible. So you don't want to turn over the soil or use a rototiller. And remember to add nutrients like organic compost to the soil. You don't have to turn it in because the nutrients are going to work their way down into the soil by themselves or with the help of those soil microorganisms. Feed your plants, but not too much. It's just like with watering your plants. Too much is not a good thing. And I know we all tend to love our plants a little too much <laughs> and we get a little carried away with the fertilizer. The important thing to know is that different types of nutrients do different types of things for certain vegetable crops. Some of them benefit from extra nitrogen if they're just producing leafy green growth. Others need extra phosphorus if they need to bloom and set fruit or if they need to form a large root like carrots and parsnips do. Always follow the label directions to the letter because this is a case where more is definitely not better. You also want to monitor your garden on a regular basis. And hey, I think it's fun to walk around the garden, right? <laughs> oh yeah, so yeah, yeah. You, it's part of the most fun part of exactly. it. Exactly, and you might spot yeah. something really cool like your first ripe tomato of the season. That's cause for celebration. But you might also notice an insect problem or maybe that some of your plants aren't getting enough water. And another thing that goes hand in hand with monitoring is keeping a garden journal. Because when we take notes on things that went well or didn't go well, we all become better gardeners year after year after year. And of course, I saved one of the most important things we can all be doing for our plants and the environment for last, and that is to go organic. The problem is synthetic pesticides kill both the bad bugs and the good ones. They are non-selective, and that means they can't tell the difference between a damaging insect and a beneficial one. Mm -hmm. Synthetic fertilizers yeah. provide way more nutrients than our plants can handle, which means the rest go into our groundwater. It's better to go with organic fertilizers. In addition, herbicides kill soil organisms, plus they persist in the environment for a lot longer than we all realize. So please use organic methods and products to grow your garden. And I'm hoping that all of these suggestions will help your crops grow really well. I would say one of the most important ones for me has been the walking around. Um, and, you know, as life gets crazy, sometimes it's kind of difficult to to do that. Or at least I've, I've found it difficult to spend maybe an hour just wandering mm -hmm. uh, aimlessly kind of because you, you almost want to be wandering aimlessly so you could you can take in all the different details of the garden right. uh, and then and then that's when you notice all of the opportunities to implement the practices that that you just laid out Susan because how would you know if, if you didn't do uh, you know if you didn't space correctly in a particular bed or you mm -hmm. fertilize too much and, unless you had the ability to kind of wander around and and check it out. But I mean, the, the higher level thing for those listening is doing all of this puts your plant in the best position to resist most of the problems and certainly a lot of the pests and disease that you're going to run into. There's a phrase when I first started gardening that I heard about quite often, IPM. And I didn't really know what it meant. And now I do. It's integrated pest management. But for those of you listening, it still sort of sounds like an overly complex or, or perhaps intimidating acronym. I'm curious, you know, how do you think about integrated pest management? And why don't we start out with just a primer on what it is? Sure. 
And, you know, when my previous book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, came out, you and I had talked about integrated pest management, um, which we also call IPM. And the thing that I wanted to focus on is that even though it's called integrated pest management, that doesn't mean it only is used for dealing with insect pests. So what it is, is a systematic approach to dealing with problems in our gardens by choosing products or methods that have the least impact on our environment. So as a refresher on how it would work with dealing with certain types of insects in your garden, is that you know if you spot some, the very first thing you need to do is to identify them and figure out what they're doing. Are they causing a lot of damage to your plants? Some of them, you know, it might be um, a beneficial insect and they're doing good things for us, but we don't realize that. Mm -hmm. But if it mm -hmm. is an insect that's causing damage, then you need to look at your options for addressing them. And so you want to choose the most environmentally friendly way of dealing with them. That might be making a simple trap, handpicking them off the plants, or using some type of an organic product. After that, you need to document how well the method worked. That is super important because if the problem comes up again, you need to decide, okay, hey, how well did that work? Should I try the same thing? Or boy, it didn't work so great, so I need to try something different. Now, there is a step in integrated pest management that I can't do, <laughs> and that is they say that if the problem's getting worse, then you need to use a chemical insecticide. I can't do that. So so you personally, Susan, you don't go to that level. I don't. I, I have created my own organic version of IPM. And if something isn't working, okay. uh, you know, I'm, I'm not going to use a pesticide because they just cause more problems than they resolve. That's for sure. You know, I'm curious. You've mentioned it twice now is this note taking this journaling or documentation of what you're doing yes. in the garden. And I, I think I'm guilty of sometimes just letting it all live in my head and trying to remember, <laughs> you know, what did I do this time? What did I do that time? I think probably a lot of people listening can relate, but I'm really curious for you. Could you walk me through how you capture all of that information? Oh, well, I guess in this day and age, it might sound kind of old fashioned. <laughs> I've been trying to figure out what's the best way to do it. And, you know, I just have a, a simple journal that I hand write in. Um, but I've been thinking about creating something just that's, you know, like a computer file where I can easily search for something within all of those notes because you know certainly handwriting in in a journal uh, you got to dig until you find what you're looking for um, but the problem with having a file on your computer is that you got to go use your computer to <laughs> to put the notes in so um, the main thing I think that folks should know is you can make your journal however you want it, you know it doesn't have to be anything fancy it doesn't have to be an official garden journal it can be a notepad or something. And then maybe what you do uh, during the off season is you transfer some of those notes to some type of an electronic file that you can access later. Um, and yeah, I keep trying to come up with the best way to do a garden journal. And um, I've been so busy, I just, you know, I haven't really fine tuned it. But I think what I want to do is, is, start using my PC more, you know, to create a file and make it uh, far more useful so that I can kind of maybe see patterns and, and uh, figure out information that I would definitely want to refer to later. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. There's a garden journal that we actually have on our store that it's been pretty helpful. I think for me, I tend to go more digital. Right. But there is something to be said about just grabbing a pen and paper. I, I use pen and paper, for example, for my garden planning. Mm -hmm. uh, but for my note taking, I, I don't know why it, it tends to go into the digital realm. But yeah, I, I think it's it's one of the most valuable skill sets that actually Jacques and I both, we sort of lament how we wish we were better at it. <laughs> uh, but may, maybe this is the season for us. But an important part of, of figuring out an IPM or integrated pest management sort of setup is just knowing what works and what doesn't work, especially if you're gonna make a move like you, Susan, where you have created an organic variant of that methodology. Um, and so I'm sort of curious for you, 
when it does get down to that most serious level where <laughs> traditional IPM would say, go with a synthetic chemical or pesticide herbicide, what is your most serious level of, of action you would take? And, you know, I haven't reached that point, which is nice. I, I have to admit, I have a pretty, yeah. a pretty happy garden. <laughs> but um, and one example of that would be if you're dealing with a plant disease and you know, it's things are not going well. You know, I always tell people, pull it up, dispose of it. Don't put it in your compost pile. There are products that you can use that um, either prevent or control certain type of di types of diseases. But if it's happening over and over and over, you might have to bite the bullet and say, you know, I'm not going to grow that crop anymore. Or even better, <laughs> is that you might look and see if there are uh, varieties of the type of crop you want to grow that have some resistance to that disease. And um, in my book, I created a chart that's all of the abbreviations you would look for on a seed packet or online when you're looking for seeds. And it's a list of uh, the abbreviations that show what resistance a certain variety has to different types of diseases. So you know, worst case scenario is it might be that, you know, I'm not growing that that particular crop or that particular variety because it just plain isn't working in my garden. Yeah, I would actually agree with that. I think something that has really improved my garden year after year has been sort of noticing which varieties are going to get hit by, by powdery mildew, for example, a little more often than the others. And then just really saying, Okay, well, do I love that variety <laughs> so much that I'm willing to to go through that pain yeah. or or no? Yeah. Uh, and a lot of the times, I mean, yeah, there are some crops that I think the answer is yes, but a lot of them the answer is no, and I can swap it out with perhaps I don't know a, a hybrid with better resistance <laughs> or or something like that, <laughs> and and you know problem solved uh, again, avoiding the problem instead of uh, kind of lamenting it once it hits the garden. But yeah, a pretty fantastic primer of integrated pest management. We'll probably end up doing a full mm -hmm. video on this topic, because it's it's a really clever way to think about how to deal with pests. And as you mentioned, Susan, pests not only in the insect form, but almost in an overall sort of problem and solution kind of framework. There's a disease that strikes tomatoes. And I already lied in the intro of this episode, because it's actually not a disease. It is what is known as an abiotic disorder. And this, of course, would be blossom end rot. Susan, I think I probably saw you raise your eyebrows there when I said disease, <laughs> because this is a common misconception, is people think that this is a you know specific problem that perhaps a biological of some sort is, is causing on tomatoes. I don't know about you, Susan, but this is the one I think you see the most sort of viral kind of mythology mm -hmm. about, because tomatoes are just a popular crop, right? And so when you see that blossom end rotting, uh, all, all sorts of very weird um, remedies are proposed. And so I figured why not start out with a definition of what what actually is this disorder? Okay. And you mentioned abiotic disorders. Another name for it is physiological disorders. And as a person might guess, they're not caused by insect pests. They're not caused by diseases. It tends to be more like environmental conditions. So things like extreme heat or unusually cool weather, or they can be caused by gardeners. <laughs> so a cultural issue, meaning something that we do to grow our plants, but sometimes what we did adversely affected our plants, even though we didn't mean to, whoops. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I think it's probably safe to say that nearly every gardener has experienced blossom and rot on their tomatoes. It can also happen with uh, things like zucchini, which I think is quite annoying, and it can happen to peppers. But for the most part, people notice it on their tomatoes, and it shows up as this sunken, leathery brown patch that's at the blossom end or the bottom end of the fruits. And... I agree with you. It has to be one of the most misunderstood disorders, but I'm going to do my best to explain it today and and actually bis, uh, and actually bust some myths. The only problem is, uh, oh, sorry. Let me let me back up for just a second here. So when fruits grow on a plant like tomatoes, they need calcium in order to develop normally. The calcium's coming from the soil. 
and it's the plant's roots that are basically delivering it to the plant. The problem is if you're not consistent about watering your tomato bed, that makes it really hard, if not impossible, for the roots to do their job. Another cause can be damaged plant roots. So if you get a little too excited about weeding around the base of your tomato plants and you damage the roots, that also makes it hard for them to move the calcium. The easiest way to prevent blossom end rot from occurring is to water the soil consistently. And I also think I should point out that most soils have plenty of calcium in them, so it's not that we need to add calcium the key is watering consistently. Now, you mentioned about on social media how there's been a lot of different myths. And I've seen some very interesting ones. Um, some folks will put Tums or some type of antacids in the soil, or they put Epsom salts in the soil. And the problem with Epsom salts is that's magnesium. It's not calcium. So it doesn't do a thing for blossom end rot. Now, I did see a social media post where somebody said their plants never get blossom and rot because they pour milk over the tops of the plants. And I thought, ay, yay, yay. And no. let me just <laughs> say that I'm not trying to be disrespectful because, you know, all of us gardeners, we try to come up with a solution to a problem and that's what they're doing. But my mm -hmm. theory is the reason these folks are being successful at not getting blossom and rot isn't with those methods, they're probably fantastic about watering their plants on a regular basis. And that's the key. You know what? And that's what it is. And I think what I've noticed, especially, you know, just I've been in this game for six, seven years now. And I've noticed that a lot of people, especially when you're beginning and you have less of a, an understanding about plant physiology and how it works, you will do something while doing seven other things, <laughs> watering appropriately, it's in the right lighting situation, you know, it's been well fertilized, the soil mix is, is nice and loose and, and, you know, well draining, whatever, all the sort of basics, then you'll add one wacky thing. And then you attribute all the success of what you're doing to that one wacky thing. And, and you don't separate all the different variables that that you're using to, to sort of grow the plant. And I think you're totally right. Because we had a we actually had a really funny video recently where we reacted to some of our audience's biggest failures in the garden and this woman was trying to battle blossom end rot and she did the same thing she went to the grocery store bought three gallons of milk oh my gosh. and dumped dumped a gallon on each of her uh tomatoes and just and it was just like in the middle of ohio summer oh my gosh right? and so they they just she's like i've never seen it curdle so fast <laughs> it was so gross i was like you know, it was a big laugh, but honestly, like you can, and I think you're right. Like you can understand why someone would think that because you look at, you do a quick Google, oh, lack of calcium. Well, milk has calcium. Yeah. Milk also has liquid. So I'm watering and giving calcium at the same time. It should be fine. Uh, and then, you know, obviously not. So. <laughs> right. And you know, when I was researching blossom and rot, it, there are some other things that I learned. And one of them is, you know, there's calcium sprays that you can buy. But if you spray the foliage, it has no way to get to the fruits. There's not a mechanism within a plant to move that calcium. So it's not really uh, fixing the problem. And also I have read that um, applying calcium directly to a fruit won't work either because the fruit doesn't have a way to absorb that calcium into it. So mm -hmm. no matter what, it's it's the watering that's the issue. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think what's helped me is, well, these days, I guess I grow most of my tomatoes directly in ground. Mm -hmm. And so the watering tends to not be as big of a challenge because I can do one of those, you know, sort of infrequent deep waters and right. t tends to be okay. Mm -hmm. um, I, I had more of a problem with blossom end rot, to be honest, when I was growing in relatively small containers. Right. And, and also trying to grow, you know, maybe an indeterminate in a, in a five gallon or something like yeah. that, where it's like, okay, maybe that wasn't my best, you know, size choice. Uh, but that's how you learn, right? Made. I mean, you see what that's works you learn. Yeah. and what doesn't, and then you modify that and you become a great gardener. <laughs> there you go. Exactly. Exactly. I think this is a problem that most people wouldn't imagine 
they would have to worry about is giving a plant too much light, yeah? Exactly. I mean, you think that's exactly what it needs in order to grow well. And um, so there are two problems that can happen when you give a plant too much light. One has to do with how it affects the foliage, and that's called leaf scorch. And the other is what affects the fruits, and that's called sun scald. So uh, this is an abiotic disorder. We talked about that yesterday, but it's a disorder that occurs usually from something we did or didn't do as gardeners, but it can also be from certain types of environmental stresses. But as far as sunburn goes or leaf scorch, um, the main reason that occurs is when you've started seedlings indoors and you think, hey, it's time to put them out in the garden and you just plant them outside. And then you come out the next day and think, what is wrong with these plants? You know, they look a little wilty, there's white patches on the leaves and so on. There's a really important step in seed starting that is important to remember. And that is hardening off the seedlings before you plant them outdoors. It's just part mm -hmm. of the whole process. And the thing is that grow lights and even a sunny windowsill that's nowhere near the amount of uh, intensity of the sunlight outdoors and the plants just can't handle it so if we rush the process and send them out to the garden that is what's going to happen now sometimes it it will set the plants back it's not a huge deal and sometimes it can actually kill the plant. So you don't want that to happen after you went to all that trouble of starting the plants from seed. It's so discouraging when yes, you do that. Uh, it is. Because you, you've you spent minimum one week, but oftentimes, honestly, more like two weeks to four weeks. And then mm -hmm. in a day, it's just, yeah. you know, there goes the tomatoes. And you're like, oh my gosh. I know. <laughs> and we get so excited. I totally get it. I've been guilty of this too. But there is a process you can put those seedlings through called hardening off, like I mentioned. And the way it works is, and I know there are variations of this, but the, here's the rough guidelines. So the first day you move the seedlings outdoors for an hour in an area with filtered sunlight, not direct sun, just for the one hour and you move them back indoors. The next day it's two hours and then bring them back inside. And so over the course of about seven to 10 days, you're gradually increasing the amount of time they're outdoors, and you're also gradually increasing the amount of sunlight that they're getting. So you're moving them slowly from filtered sunlight to full sun. At the end of the process, those seedlings are gonna be ready to be transplanted into the garden, and they're going to do great. The one thing I wanted to mention though, is if you work full time, you know, I, I get emails from people who say, well, great, I work full time. What am I supposed to do? Because I don't have anybody to move my plants in and out. And so what I would recommend you do is start the process when you have a couple of days off. So let's say it's a weekend. And so do that same time frame that I mentioned with the one hour and then the two hours. On your work days, put the plants where they're in like filtered sunlight you might even use a shade cloth over them if you're not sure how intense the sunlight's going to be, but you leave them out while you're at work, bring them back indoors at night, and then just keep doing that over the course of a few days. And I think that the plants will become acclimated to the sunlight without any problems. Do you find, Susan, if someone says, that's, you know, I'm, I'm a new gardener, I'm busy, what's the what's the easiest possible way I could harden off? Do you find someone can get away with simplifying it a bit? Or have you found like it really does need to go through that process? I have seen videos by different people where they say you can hurry up the process and leave them out for longer than, than uh, what I'm prescribing here. Um, you know, take advantage of overcast days, for example. Um, so that they can spend the day out longer. The main thing is you're not wanting to do this dramatic change of the amount of indoor light to outdoor sunlight. Um, I think, you know, I think a person can probably hurry this along a little bit. Just even so, take your time and 
keep an eye on your seedlings, see how they're doing. You know, if you start seeing them looking um, a little bit wilty, that's definitely not a good thing. And the other thing I might mention is that when you put them outdoors, make sure there's plenty of moisture in the soil because, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that's like adding one more stress to the whole process. I agree. I think one of the things I've historically been kind of bad at is that hardening off process because we typically tend to start seeds outdoors Mm -hmm. um, in our climate here. And so I haven't been forced to (laughs) go, go through that stark change from, from the late winter to the early spring. Mm -hmm. Uh, And so when I actually do do it, I don't quite do it the standard way. And then I I pay the price. Right. And where I live, I'm in Spokane, Washington, we have a real winter (laughs) and, uh, and a very nice summer, but I have to start a lot of things ahead of time indoors. So I think that's, that's why this is first and foremost on my mind, but I was going to explain the other type of uh, situation that can occur when the plants get too much light. And that's the sun scald that's only affecting the fruits on the plants. And the way, what it looks like is sort of like a white papery patch on a tomato or a pepper. You know, probably somebody has seen this. And that is sun scald. It seems like it mostly impacts things like um, cucumbers, maybe melons, uh, sometimes winter squash, actually, but mostly eggplants, peppers, and tomatoes. And what causes it is if we get, oh, I like to put it, uh, put it this way, if we get the pruners in our hands <laughs> and we get a little carried away with pruning leaves off the plants, that's the problem. And that's because those leaves are actually sheltering the fruits from too much sun. Now, mm-hmm. so I tell people, okay, put down the pruners, <laughs> walk away, uh, don't prune too much. But sometimes there are instances where we do need to d- remove leaves. Um, so if you do have a tomato plant, for example, and it's got some type of a d- disease problem, you can prune off those diseased leaves, dispose of them, don't put them in your compost pile. And that is, is a way to kind of slow the disease's spread. But since those fruits are suddenly exposed to the sunlight, I think it's a good idea to drape some... Uh, or suspend some shade cloth above the plants to decrease the intensity of the sunlight. And then also thinking proactively for future gardens, any time that you plant something like tomatoes, for example, always put a layer of mulch on the surface of the soil. And then that way, if there are disease pathogens in the soil, it makes it harder for them to come into contact with or get splashed up onto the plant's leaves. I, I, I think all of what you said, specifically when you're talking about you know. tomatoes, it's very, very good advice. Um, I think with tomatoes, it is really the, the crop of the garden, mm-hmm. I think, for most people, especially when, when you're coming from the outside in and, and just getting started. Yeah. Uh, and and it's, it's such a vibrant and like full crop as far as varieties and, and growth habits and styles and stuff that there is this tendency to have all these different tricks and tips for it. Uh, and, and sometimes, you know, again, going back to the basics and preventing all of these problems before they start is the way to do it. I found that uh, when I tend to over prune, like you said, uh, I, I do tend to, to scald or to blister or it maybe it makes them a little bit more prone to cracking <laughs> or something like that. Right. Uh, and when I when I chill out and just relax, they they tend to do a little better, provided I'm doing some of those basics right. I don't know about you, Susan, but to me, pests are easier to help people with. Disorders like we've talked about, blossom end rot, et cetera, easier to help people with. Diseases always seem to be a bit of a challenge for people more so than the rest. Boy, I couldn't agree with you more because uh, I think they're very difficult to diagnose. And, you know, we've talked about the importance of monitoring your garden on a daily basis. And so let's say you're out in the garden and you notice a plant just doesn't look right. You know, maybe the leaves are mottled, maybe something, is, some part of the plant is wilting. Something just doesn't look right. And so it's like, okay, what the heck is that? And what do I do about it? And so I always recommend the first thing is to do a little bit of troubleshooting. And it helps to think 
first of all, if anything out of the ordinary happened in the last few weeks, you know, maybe your weather was really rainy and humid. Maybe you brought some new plants home, uh, you know, from a greenhouse or a plant sale or something, and you thought they, they looked a little funky, but, oh, well, they would be okay in my garden. You know, maybe it's something like that. Maybe the plants were exposed to herbicides. That can certainly make a plant look like it's diseased. And do you see the same type of damage on other types of vegetable crops? So not just a single type of a crop like tomatoes. So you want to take pictures of the damage, zoom in on them so you can really study the damage. And then, yeah, you need to attempt to identify or at least narrow down the disease and I think that diseases are super hard to identify. Fortunately, you've got some options. So first of all, you could uh, take your photo, look at it, do a web search on the name of the plant you see the disease or, or problem on, and type in a search like pumpkin leaves are white, which is probably powdery mildew. Maybe my tomatoes have circular rings on them. So that's tomato spotted wilt fires, probably. <laughs> you get the idea. You can email the photos to your local master gardener group because they will help you with a the diagnosis. They don't charge you a cent for that help. Or you can use my new book, The Vegetable Garden Problem Solver Handbook, to narrow it down. So one of the things I did for the book is I created this massive chart that is organized by the name of the crop. So let's say, well, we'll stick with pumpkins here. Let's say you're having a problem with your pumpkin plants, so you go to that part of the chart, and there's a whole list of descriptions that show what, uh, or talk about the type of damage you might see. Each of those are going to point to a specific disease. So when you find something that sounds like what you're seeing, then you go to that disease profile. It's going to tell you, is it a fungus, a bacteria, or a virus? What is it doing to your plants? What other plants are susceptible to it? And the very best part of all is that I list all kinds of organic methods and strategies and products that will help you with this problem. So there's the, the kind of this process involved uh, in trying to narrow down what it is you're dealing with. Yeah, I, I think for me, the visual mapping <laughs> is is probably the most helpful. Right. Um, it, especially like, again, going back to those tomatoes, like what is septoria versus alternaria <laughs> versus fusarium <Okay>. versus powdery? <laughs> you know, like even a few of those, you go, well, one of them has a black ring with nothing in the middle. One of them has black oh. spots. It's like, okay, how am I expected to remember all of this right. unless I'm... You know, honestly, unless I'm someone like yourself, a master gardener, right? I, I'm not a master gardener. Mm -hmm. and, and so I, I think that's really helpful. It kind of reminds me of our friend Jessica Walliser's book, Good Bug, Bad yes. Bug, back in the day where, and I remember her saying like she was surprised that that book did so well. And I was like, I'm not because <laughs> what what someone wants is they want to go out and say, that's a good bug. And then I saw, I see that on the page. It says good bug. Okay, I'm, I'm good. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and kind of it sounds like you've you've taken a somewhat similar approach with a portion of, of yours as well. Right. So there's over 200 photos in the book. And what I was trying to do is help people see what a disease, a specific disease looks like on a crop or a couple different kinds of crops. And if it's one that the, an insect helped spread the disease pathogens, I have a picture of what that bug is. And with my previous book, The Vegetable Garden Pest Handbook, that also has over 200 photos. And, and I was thinking the exact same thing you were, Kevin, because I thought if people can see what an, an insect looks like at different stages in their life cycle, and they can see what beneficial insects look like, then hopefully before they stomp on a bug, <laughs> they check out what it is because if it's a beneficial bug, boy, you sure want that in your garden. So yeah, same thing with the diseases. I thought the more photos, the better to help people narrow down what it is. And then I give them lots of information about uh, different types of things we should be doing in our gardens, like, you know, not crowding plants together. Um, if you're having a disease issue, sterilizing your pruners in between cuts and in between plants, 
um, disposing of infected plant material, you know, the best ways to water your plants. And then I explain how different kinds of organic products like biofungicides and plant extracts work so that you can control or prevent diseases. Yeah, I think to me, it's probably one of the more frustrating things is is a disease. Pests, I feel like I have a little more control over. If it really got down to it, I could try to hand pick them off and right. just physically remove. Disease feels like once it gets past a certain point, I sort of like give up hope. I'm like, oh, you know, this one's just gone. Right. You know, rest in peace or you want to <laughs> rip it out. And you start, you kind of start to freak out because you, you don't really know how spreadable a particular one is off the top of your head. And so you go, okay, well, do I just rip this one out right now? Um, all that kind of stuff. And so I think, you know, a guide like that is, is going to be really, really helpful for folks. And honestly, just the approach you've had over the, over the week of first do the basics, <laughs> then start going deeper and understanding what are the different categories of problems that you can have. There's the abiotic ones or the more plant conditions, right? Mm -hmm. that, that are gardener environmentally caused. Um, that, then there's the disease, then there's the pests. Uh, and then of course, just there's like the overall mm -hmm. knowledge of how a plant grows and how to actually help it express what it sort of is kind of begging you to let it do, yes, right? Exactly. I, lo I love the quote of, of like, you don't grow plants, they grow themselves, you just give them the conditions that they, they require. And that kind of is your job as a gardener, you're, you're the steward of, of them, not really the the reason they're they're doing what they're doing that's that's kind of on them yeah exactly i completely agree and and that's the thing if we start off our plants well they're going to do well you know there are some things that happen and uh hopefully i've covered all of them <laughs> but um you know it's not the end of the world you probably have way more options than you realize so you know gardening is mm -hmm. I, to me it's such a joy you know, and you get to eat what you grew. I mean, you can't top that. You can't beat it. I mean, you can't beat it. And honestly, I've, I've actually been getting a lot of joy out of just looking at what I've grown because I'm getting more into the flowers and ornamental side of things as well. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it, it's just it's just such a joy inducer. And if you can avoid the problems, then you'll keep doing it more and you'll get more of that. So, Susan, thanks so much for coming on. If, if people want to find you, uh, where can they connect with you online? Well, uh, my website is Susan's in the garden.com mm -hmm. and i'm posted daily to facebook and instagram under susan's in the garden and i nice. also have over 470 gardening how-to videos on my youtube channel which is surprise susan's in the garden Susan's in the garden <laughs> <laughs> yeah I've, I've been really getting into the videos or, well actually for quite a few years I, you know it's it's one thing to write about it and the great thing about a book is you've got that information right there you can always go to it but if you can demonstrate just like you do how something mm -hmm. is done or how to take care of a problem or whatever, that makes all the difference in the world. I agree. Yeah. Well, you can check all of Susan's resources down below as well as grab a copy of either of her books, maybe both. So Susan, thanks so much for coming on again. It's been great having you on. Thank you, Kevin. It's a lot of fun. <laughs> <laughs>